screws loose, they done stripped the bolts on them. Should've never sent them to pick up the work for them. Sprayed the park and had my shit inside the car. Marcus Smart Boy was shooting with a 36 on him. Said if he wasn't in a rush, they was all goners. Tank cursive on the jets, he was gonna show and John him. Hello and welcome to another edition of Chuddy's Corner. Bringing you all the latest on the Boston Celtics. I'm your host, Ben Handler, at King Chuddy on Twitter. Joined, as always, by my co-host, Nick Perino at underscore Nick Perino on Twitter. And today, we are joined by a very special guest. You may know him as Dakota in Braintree. That would be at Dakota Happis, H-A-P-P-A-S. Dakota, thanks for coming on. It's a pleasure to have you. How are you doing today? Hey, thanks for having me. The, so the first thing is, you call this uh, Chuddy's Corner. Why are you in a corner? I mean, I see a lot of vanilla background. I'm the guest. I've got tons of stuff up behind me. I mean, you guys got to you step do. up your Zoom background game. So, so full disclosure, uh, I work as a teacher. So this is my summer vacation. I am road tripping around. I am actually uh, tucked away in a guest bedroom of a, a friend of my girlfriend's house where we're staying in Louisville. So yeah. uh, had to do the setup from scratch today. So I'm not, I'm, I'm a, this is a road game for me, despite being the host. All right. That, that, that yeah, makes my, a lot of sense. My excuse is that there's people painting my house right now. I didn't want to listen to them scraping on the walls. <laughs> and I have a six month old baby. So I figured getting out of the house was probably my best option. I could go grab my Larry Bird jersey from uh, the closet and throw it up behind me if that helps. But I figure uh, most people listen to the audio. <laughs> I, I still have somewhere in my office. I have the uh, the old baby, uh, Larry Bird baby and the Magic Johnson baby. You know, that thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it, yeah. Uh, I should have had it handy. I think it's in the <laughs> other room. And I uh, always used to have it. Uh, I always like buying like these weird type of posters. I you know and. uh but uh, I moved yeah. into this office like three years ago. They uh, they sold the uh, the office building I was in, so I had to move into a different office in Braintree. So I hate I hate being at home, even when I had young kid like being having young kids trying to work at home is I think is the worst because your wife will just want to dump everything on you because mm -hmm. they're there and they don't and they don't realize right. that you're trying to work and make money and support everybody. So to me, I, I've always been an office guy. She thinks you're just sitting around doing nothing all day, right? Hundred percent, hundred percent. I got the same problem with my wife too, because I'm in real estate. So, you know, if I'm sitting at home, you know, I'm just kind of on the internet or I'm making calls or whatever. So she said the other day, she was like, you know, maybe you should start going back in the office because if you're home, I think you're, you know, I think you're home, and she wants me to help, you know, with the baby and do stuff. It's like, you know, I think maybe I should. Uh, I think maybe you're right about that. Yeah, it's funny. I think I think girls growing up, they have this perception because back in the day, you know, most most dads, they were hands on. Right. My dad was a meat, my dad was a butcher. He was a meat cutter. Um, you know, my, my brother is a plumber. You know, like these are blue collar stuff that they say, you know what, that's work. And I'm like, what's the difference? I work 60 hours a week. They work 60 hours a week. Why is his work, you know, real work and mine's not, you know, exactly. So, exactly. uh, you know, maybe just grab a wrench. Say you're taking up plumbing or something and say, you know what, I've got my wrench and my, my tool belt and going out. So it's brilliant. I'm going to have to give that a shot. Love that idea. So a uh, bit of housekeeping before we get into it. If you guys are joining us for the first time or not, you can follow the show Chuddy's Corner wherever you get your podcasts. Apple, Spotify, just search Chuddy's Corner. That's Chuddy with two Ds. Give us a like, give us a subscribe, give us a rating. Follow any of us on Twitter. Uh, you can hit us up for any Celtics banter. It's obviously an exciting time for uh, all New England sports. We got the Pats are back on the practice field. The Sox are continuing just a super fun season. The Bruins uh, just had a bit of a bonanza in free agency. And like I said, we got the NBA draft tonight. So naturally, we're here to talk some Celtics. Uh, this today will be a far cry from from the last few years. The draft has been a, a pretty big night for the Celtics for some time now. I mean, since really the big three era, this is the first time in, in years that we haven't had a first round pick. Uh, the last time we didn't have multiple picks was the year we grabbed Rob Williams with the 27th pick. Um, but tonight, only, the Celtics go into the draft, at least with only the 45th pick. Um, 
a lot of debate over what they should do with that pick, if they should hold on to it, uh, what have you. We'll get into that. But uh, the reason we brought on our guest, Dakota, today is he had a take that uh, caught hold of Twitter. I would brought out a lot of reaction. I would have to say mostly negative. I'm sure you had a few few supporters rushing to your defense, but uh, I, I don't think there was any supporters. I don't no, think. all right, no supporters. I, I, I think I think any of the supporters were probably being sarcastic, right? <laughs> Just like sure. half of the people that saw that that trade proposal mm-hmm. and thought I that I was being sarcastic. And <laughs> unfo- I let me just tell you something, okay? Sure. It it does sound outlandish, okay, mm-hmm. on on the surface. Yeah. But you have to understand, I am a bleed green guy. I'm a diehard. I watch out of town NBA games, regular season games. I'm that guy. Mm-hmm. I traveled as much as I could to the Las Vegas summer league games, and uh, and and even watched it non sell because I I love I love the skill level. Okay. So to me. We haven't won a championship. I'm a, I'm about winning championships. I'm about having chemistry on the court. And unfortunately, I woke up that morning and the Beal rumors were ranted how Beal's coming to the Celtics, this and that. And I just got super frustrated. I'm like, because Beal, yes, is a top 20. Like, I, I think there's, there's a top group, yeah. right? And then there's a bunch of other guys in that that 10 to 40 area that you could move them around, you know, and it, it's even like a guy like DeAndre Ayton, right, who, who, who took his, level, his game to another level this year. Sure. If you were to start a team right now, right, after the, the top few, DeAndre Ayton would have to kind of be on that list because he's an athletic big that can defend the rim. He can shoot. He can score. He's young. You know, so to me, there's a lot of guys in that that lower tier, that top 40, that you could kind of mix and match depending on what that team needs and everything. So getting back to like that take, I was just super frustrated where, you know what? I don't want to give up Jalen Brown because that was going to be the price to go there. And trust me, mm-hmm. I'm, I've been a proponent on getting rid of the Jays because of the chemistry issues. And I wasn't the only one that saw it, but people just on the surface that don't understand, they say, oh, Jalen's great and Jason's great. Yes, they are. And then I think without each other, they'd be a lot greater. So if you're gonna have to trade Jalen Brown to go get Bradley Beal, I think that's a bad deal. I think from a talent standpoint, that is a bad deal because you're not gonna, you don't get the true value, I think, of what Jalen Brown could be. Because if Tatum wasn't on this team, and it was Jalen Brown's team, you're sitting here going, oh, I'm never going to trade Jalen Brown. I'm not going to do this. He's the guy that is the vocal leader. He's the, you know, he, he, he's, the, he's the one that's going to bring the cohesiveness, go out there and recruit, you know. So to me, why just get rid of Jalen Brown to appease Jason Tatum? Because, oh, he might be a flight risk in four or five years and might want to leave. Let me tell you something, okay? Jason Tatum either wants to be here and die in green or he doesn't. And I don't like to play those games. And sometimes you know right away whether a guy is a true Celtic or not. And I'm, I'm sorry, Celtic pride, I grew up on it. You know right away if a guy has Celtic pride. It pissed me off when they traded Ray Jay Crowder. Jay Crowder was a no one, okay, in the Dallas Mavericks. And soon as he came to the Celtics, he bled green. You could see it on the court, his passion, he handled himself their best way. And he became a great three and D guy. And he was, he improved a hundred percent from coming here from Dallas. And when you had that contract and then saying, all right, well, now we're going to get rid of guys that bleed green that fit in. And by the way, Jay Crowder has been on how many good teams and made big runs and almost won an NBA championship. Those are the guys. That's what you call cohesiveness guys that you want to build around. So when I hear that we just want to bring in Bradley Beal, to appease a budding superstar. Tatum's not there yet, okay? Because to me, Kawhi Leonard, he's a superstar. He's a guy that goes out, no matter what happens, he makes everybody around them better. He can shoot terrible, but he's a lockdown defender, and he's all about the team first. And unfortunately, there are too many guys on this Celtics team over the past three or four years that were not about the team first. We even heard it all last year. Everybody was getting their shots up because they wanted to be all-stars. So you know what? I'm sick of hearing these people that are all about me, me, me. 
And unfortunately, as good as Jason Tatum is, he just has more of that me. It's about more about him and about the team. And so to me, again, my frustration is I don't want to give up Jalen Brown, okay, for a guy like Bradley Beal, because I honestly think that takes a step back in your progression in the narrative about building with these two young guys that we've heard, oh, we can't trade Tatum, we can't trade Brown. That's the narrative that we were pushed, right? But now all of a sudden, we want to trade for an older guy that's a superstar. Bradley Beal's up there, right? He's he's a good talent, but is he going to move the needle? Is he going to is he going to get us back to the Eastern Conference Finals? Is he going to win an NBA championship with his contract? Are the Celtics going to be able to like put other pieces around him? There's all these question marks. So if you just want to say, you know what? Bring in Bradley Beal to appease Tatum because it's going to be fun and we can have a dual Lillard and McCollum, then that's fine. But I don't want that. I want a team that they can put on there that seven to eight deep that we know that can compete in an NBA championship. And unfortunately, I don't think the Tatum Beal, I think it's easier to get that way if they trade Tatum. And to me, the, 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 pro, the, the trade that I proposed on the surface looks horrible. And I understand why, you know, it got like 50,000 plus views and I got beaten up by 49,998 of the people that viewed it, okay? I get it. But one, if you end up if you end up doing that deal, and I'm not saying it's gonna happen, okay? It was more about, I don't want Beal coming here. I'd rather send Tatum to, if Tatum really wants to play with Beal, let him go to Washington. Let's figure out what we can get back from Washington to try to put a team together that makes sense on building for the future. And a guy like Rui, who I love, who's only played two years in the NBA that's young, is a physical specimen. He's gotten better every year. And I think potentially could be one of those top 40, top 30, top 20 potentially players. And when I throw out the com com comment about Giannis, and I like to call him Giannis because I'm half Greek and, you know, I, we, from Boston, we like to add letters and pronunciations and take them away. So it was one that I've always called Giannis Giannis. So that's why I always call him that. People make fun of it, but so be it. Um, so, so to me, Rui has the type of athletic talent that if he got more than 31 minutes a game, wasn't on a team with Westbrook, Beal, et cetera, he'd be putting up 21 22 a game, a lot of rebounds, and you'd be like, he's untouchable. And that's important. So to me, I started with Rui, and then I said, all right, who else do we know that the Celtics have interest in that they have need on this team? We've never had a knockdown shooter from three since Ray Allen, okay? That was it. Ray Allen was probably the guy that you know that when the ball got swung to the corner, he was going to make the shot. Bert, Bertans is one of those guys that we tried to get and they wanted two number ones for him. They're unhappy with him. He had a down year. So be it. You have a down year. Shooters have a down year. Washington was a bunch of misfits this year. The chemistry wasn't there. That doesn't take away that, that he's not a legit six man rotation guy on a team that you need. You saw what the guys like Tyler Hero did of a guy that knocked down threes that spread the defense. You need a guy like him if you want to win an NBA championship. So to me, and then the other guy was Thomas Bryant, who again, I follow outside NBA. I see the athletic talent of these guys all the time. If he didn't get it, if he didn't have an ACL injury, that guy would be talked about as one of the the best up and coming big guys. Okay. In the NBA. So let's remove that fact, because if you look at his numbers and his progression, he is also increased every year. So I get it. I'm trying to trade a quarter, right. For a bunch, a dime. I consider Rui a dime, right. He's a 10 cent piece that could become a quarter and then a bunch of nickels, which you could become dimes. Okay. And then at the overall value that gives you cap flexibility, right. Because that's something else to think about a little bit by bringing on some of these three guys. Because if you bring in Beal in his contract and you have Tatum, you don't have much flexibility. Jalen Brown has a really good contract, okay? And so to me, you have more flexibility having a guy like Jalen Brown. And then when Al Horford's contract expires, that if you were able to do a deal with Washington, and I'm not saying those are the three that you'd only get back. You'd probably maybe try to get their number one this year. 
Um, I love Davian Mitchell from, from, from Baylor. Um, you know, he's a guy that the Celtics I think could use. They need a general in the backcourt. I've talked about it before. This team was missing a type a point guard. Um, and I'd love to talk about Ben Simmons a little bit because he's on the, on the block about that. Um, so to me, I think if you can get back, it's not going to happen. That trade's not going to happen, but I threw it out there out of frustration and says, you know what? Let's send Tatum. If Tatum wants to play with Beal so much, let's send the Washington, let him play with Beal. And here's the guys that I think would work coming back and fill in around the pieces. So that's where it came from on the surface to the average people that kind of look like, how can you trade a young superstar for three misfits? They're not three misfits. Okay. They're two young talent up and coming. One gets hurt a lot. The other guy's a knockdown three who has a lot of value in this lead. And if you can get a couple of first round picks for it, and if you draft right and cap flexibility, it makes sense. And that's all it was. Is it a fair trade? Most trades aren't fair. Would Washington get the better of that deal? 100%. So it's a lot about frustration and about, about this Tatum Beal, superstars, people wanting to play here, people wanting to play there. That's what I'm pissed about. Because what I'm even worse pissed about when Kyrie Irving came here, I, 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 I was rejuvenated as a Celtics fan because they finally got one of the best talents in the NBA. Celtics hardly ever have one of the top players in the NBA. Kyrie Irving was that guy. And I'm like, here is the gateway to bring Kevin Durant here. And I honestly believe that there was a plan in place that once when they met with Durant in the off season, Durant says, you know what? I'm not ready to come here. I want to play with so-and-so. If you guys got him, I would think about coming there. And I think Danny went out and got Kyrie Irving because Durant mentioned that the previous year in that meeting out in Long Island or the Hamptons, right, where Kelly Olenek showed up, okay? So Kyrie Irving comes here, and then they realize that Danny must have said, you know what, wait a minute, for me to get Kevin Durant here, I'm, I have to do something with Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum, and I'm not going to do that, Kyrie, and something changed. Kyrie said, wait a minute. We were coming here because you met with Durant. Durant wanted to come here. He said he almost came to here instead of winning Golden State. And the Celtics were putting a path together to bring Durant and Kyrie here. And that blew up. And this whole thing gets me more frustrated because it's dictating what the GMs can do about really trying to put a team on the court with solid chemistry to win an NBA title. Same thing with even Brooklyn. Look what Brooklyn did with all that talent this year. Didn't happen. I think all of us would have agreed that if they put a gun to our head and says, who's going to win the NBA title this year? We would have said Brooklyn. As long as everybody's healthy, we would say Brooklyn. And even with Kyrie being hurt or Hammy with Harden with a little Hammy, that Brooklyn cast was pretty good. They had a bench that could beat people. I mean, so to me, I was, I'm, I'm like the trades out of frustration. I would trade Jalen Brown, but I don't want it to do it to trade for Beal. So I was given an alternative off the cuff that morning and I'm not unhappy. I'm not, I'm not mad that I said it because I believed it at the time. And I still believe it today that I'd rather see Jalen Brown hair than Bradley Beal. Okay. Well, that is a, a lot to unpack there, obviously. Um, thank you for that. That was a good thorough explanation, which I think uh, answered a lot of the questions that at least I had up, up from the rant where I was wondering, you know, does he really think this could happen? Does he really want this, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so first of all, I actually agree with most of what you said. Um, I was going to bring up the Crowder thing even because I know that that's been a big thing for you for years. Yeah, We're on the same page. Like I, I love Crowder. I still do. It infuriates me how people don't understand his value. But I think a huge problem with talking about the NBA in general is there's just like no nuance and no context behind it. So for example, how we're putting together ratings of, of players. So you could say someone like you brought up DeAndre Ayton, who you say now probably has to be in that mix of like top 40 guys. And I would agree. I mean, great postseason wore down a little bit in the finals. And I mean, that's understandable for a guy that young, all of that. But overall, great playoffs took a step forward. But I mean, again, it's all context based. He was really the third option on a team that had one of the best point guards of our lifetime setting the table for him and stuff. I mean, you put a team together where DeAndre Ayton is your best player, that's a lottery team. So, so much has to do with being in the right situation, the right fit, having the right talent around you. Um, and I mean, that changes things. That has completely changed the perception of DeAndre Ayton. If you look to what it was a year ago before sure. Chris Paul showed up, you know, people would have, would have laughed at that take, obviously. So 
it just goes to show how much can be changed by fit. Um, well, the, impo the important thing there is that yeah. if you have a center that is one of your best players, you absolutely need a point guard general. You right. can't, you can't have, yeah, and I, I, you know, even like Marcus Smart's not really a true point guard, right? I mean, he can facilitate, he can make decent decisions, but you need a true point guard if you're going to have a center that's one, going to be one of your key pieces. Well, and it's the kind of center that Aiton is too. I mean, he's not a guy who's going to look for 20 post touches a game and is going to back guys down and score 30 points for you. He wants to set picks. He wants to rim run. He's uh, not going to take a ton of shots. Like he wants to fit in. He's not a guy who you're going to run your offense through probably at any point in his career. I mean, we'll see how he develops and stuff. Who knows? But for example, where the Celtics now have a guy back like Al Horford, who you can run him from the high post. He can kind of run your offense. I mean, no one's calling Al like a point center, but he's just he's a, he's obviously a really good player. Um, and someone like Aiton, who's not going to command the ball and needs a lot of shots. They're very different stylistically. But I think Al is similar in the sense that he can really fit in on a good team and um He'll look a lot better on a good team than on a bad team. I mean, right. un unless that team is Philly and using him out of position. <laughs> um, so then anyway, going um, further into your take, we're, I mean, at least I am in agreement. We argued about this on the last pod. So I am 100% with you. I would not trade Jalen for Beal. I also don't think the Celtics are going to trade Jalen for sure. Beal. Yeah, I, I really don't think they're thinking about this. I think this is, again, more of like, a fan based narrative. And like you alluded to probably more casual fans who don't really watch the NBA at large, they hear the name and think star star, we need stars, we need stars. Right. And like I said, there's no context. So for me, I, I agree with you. I think Beal is a very, very good player. I'm not sure he's a true number one. Like I think if we got him, I think Tatum is still better overall player than Beal. Uh, maybe not right this second, but that's certainly the trajectory he's headed towards. Either way, Beal's not one of those like top seven to 10 guys who you just plug him in and you're a contender, obviously, sure. as the Wizards haven't been. However, he's obviously he's a very good player. But to me, the whole point of bringing in Beal is to build a big three of Tatum, Brown and Beal. Right now, yeah. obviously, everyone wants to jump to Brown because he's basically our obvious asset. And that seems like a flip. But I I'm with you. He's younger. He's cheaper. He's a better defender. Uh, I mean, I think there's a very good chance within a year or two, they're pretty much equal players. And Brown has a higher ceiling at this point, I would say, other than as maybe a scorer. Um, the thing which, is, Beal is 28, right? Yeah, I think he's about 28, yeah. Yeah, you know, I think that's right. Yeah, these guys are basketball lifers. There's risk factor. We saw it with happen with Kemba. They get worn down. Just think of the yeah. volume of shots that Beal had, a, had had been taken since he got into the NBA, much like Kemba did. There's no telling that once even Beal gets here, he's going to be healthy. We know Jalen Brown. He's young. Has Jalen Brown had you know, minor injuries? You know, that's it. You know, I think normal as your body is developing as a 23, 24-year-old, your, your body starts to grow into being a man. That's no, that's normal stuff. But once you start getting close to 30, which Beal is going to be, you don't even know if all of a sudden this thing could blow up in their face, even if Beal came here. Exactly. So right. never, never trade five years of equal talent again no. to satisfy Jason Tatum, right. who does not care. <laughs> these people on Twitter saying, how do you know that Jason Tatum doesn't care? Because I watch every freaking NBA game of every out of town. And I can see the guys on the court who care who say, how many times have you seen Jason Tatum say, you know what? I got you. I got you. I'm locking down you tonight. Okay. It's not just about offense, not just about volume. It's about grabbing the bull by the horns and locking down their other, the, the other team's best score. And I'm sorry, if I'm six, eight, six, nine, six, ten, and Jason Tatum and have the athletic wingspan, I'm going to say, forget about me being the best score in the league. I'm going to be the best defender because I have the physical talent to do that. And that's why under the reason why I am, I am, I'm okay with trading Tatum because Brown cares about his defense. Jalen does care about his defense. Tatum does not. He might say it, but you got to show it to me on the court. So I'm going to push back against that. Cause I, I don't know. I think Tatum has, has proven himself to be a very good defender. I've seen him lock down guys like Kawhi Leonard, taking that challenge on in games. He, uh, you know, one taking, time. 
One game. Okay, but how many times? We don't play these guys a lot. My point is he's still young. He's got a lot of, especially, I mean, this year, so many weird things happened this year that I'm giving a lot of guys, not just on the Celtics, but around the league, a pass. I'm willing to see what Tatum could do. He's proven that he can play defense. He's a much, much better off-ball defender than Brown is. The point is, I don't even want to make this a Tatum versus Brown thing. Sure. Because like you said, I don't want to trade Brown. I'm not trading Brown unless it basically makes us an automatic contender. There's probably five to ten guys in the league I would trade Brown for. And Beal is not close to that. Yeah. Now, here's the thing, though. When you say we're just doing this to appease Tatum, the Tatum Beal stories, those are out there ad nauseum. We've heard it a million times. But it's not like we've heard Tatum say at any point that he's dissatisfied, that he's demanding Beal to be here. I mean, I think he's more joked about it. But to his credit, I think he's been very, you know, hands off. He and whatever he said, he said, you know, that's up to the organization. He said all the right things. Are, are him and Jalen best fr- friends? No. Do they have to be? No. They seem to have a great working relationship. They get along fine. And wait more importantly, wait 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 they're wait under contract for three and four more years. On. Like, how I, do I you say they have a great working relationship? That means that those two guys excel and push each other on the court. And I have no evidence of seeing that they push each other on the court. How many times have you seen Jalen and Jason, Jason, have carry the team together? Usually it's one or the other. It's, it's, it's Tatum is here or not. And when they've been injured, we've seen Jalen Brown step up and go, wow, he can actually be our best player. And then when Jalen Brown has been hurt and it's just Tatum, you see more Tatum going, you know what? Hey, wow, Tatum is this superstar, and look what he could do without Jalen Brown. I don't think they complement each other on the court. And the other thing about Tatum that bothers me, I don't think he makes his teammates better. He is good. Tatum's phenomenal, but I don't think he makes his teammates better. And okay, but how many – go ahead. How many scoring wings with Tatum's size, skill set, and all that – we're making their teammates better and at his age and this late into his in, into their career. I mean, look at a guy like Kawhi Leonard, who you mentioned four years into the league. He wasn't close to where Tatum is right now. Like the NBA trajectory, but look around well, the league. Like you, Jordan you, got there in year seven. LeBron got there in year nine. You Giannis just got okay. there year eight. Look at Kawhi had Tim Duncan pretty yeah, much. Okay. Exa- well, of course. Okay. Tatum doesn't have Tim Duncan. Okay. Totally Tatum- agree. But if Tatum would, all right. So do you think Larry Bird made his teammates better? He did. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Do you think Magic Johnson made his teammates better? Of course, but okay. he's a point guard. I mean, those well, are two iconic. Well, hold, hold on like, a second. No, go ahead. Magic, go ahead. Magic Johnson was not a point guard. He played point guard. He was, he was a forward that played point guard because he made his teammates better by controlling the ball. And he also, and he also learned how to shoot. And we can tie those two together with Ben Simmons, because when we talk about Ben Simmons, <laughs> if there's one guy that I think the Celtics need, it's Ben Simmons. He is, ooh, ooh. he is the point guard. Look at, I don't know when, about that one. Look at when Rondo was here, he could not shoot, but Rondo was a great quarterback. He was a, he was a good defender. Okay, but he had you, three Hall of Famers on offense to do the scoring. I, I, I mean, I, again, it comes I, back to fit. I get it, though. But if you're having Tatum, Jalen Brown, Al Horford, maybe someone else that they're able to bring in, right? Would you say if Tatum and Jalen Brown go down the path that they on, they could be Hall of Famers? Absolutely. Okay. So if you brought Ben Simmons oh. in here. He's okay, well, with two well hold on. But I think the point is, okay. In that, in that sense, yes, I agree with you. Simmons would fit just given his current contract. I don't know how we're getting him, I guess, without giving up those guys is where I was going with that. If you're adding him to what we already have, well, sure. That's that's I, meant. Different... I, I, I meant okay, the team. Gotcha. Tatum, gotcha. Tatum and Brown need someone that's a type A point guard quarterback. Okay. Ben I agree. Simmons, and Ben Simmons is as cheap as you're going to be able to get well, him right now. <laughs> yeah, but unfortunately, I still – don't think that's cheap enough for the Celtics to realistically well, get involved. If you can, if you can I get what up. you're saying, but if I think you, I think you want a guy similar to Simmons stylistically in terms of a, a pass first point guard. I agree. I think for too long the Celtics have been chasing a score first point guard with you know good players going back to right. Isaiah, 
Kyrie, Kemba, but it's been a point guard who really is looking for his own offense, is not a true distributor, despite maybe assist numbers, what have you, but guys who are looking to score most more than anything else, and guys who are a liability on defense. So that's why, is Marcus Smart a true point guard, like you said? No, maybe not. But he is a guy, he plays his best, I think, when he's in the point guard role. I think when he's in the off guard role is when you see some of that poor shot selection. Sure. Because again, he's playing off the ball. He's he's filling that role. If he catches and shoots and it's an open shot, he should shoot. So people are going to get mad, whatever. When he plays point guard and is running the offense, is he elite at that? No, but I like kind of the way the offense flows more. I think there's more ball movement. I think it resembles more, um, you know, of the kind of offense I want to see. Is he the perfect guy for that role? Maybe not, but I'd rather roll with someone like Marcus than going for another score first point guard. And obviously there are better guys out there. On this team right now, mm-hmm. and I love Marcus Smart. I've been a big proponent of Marcus Smart. I don't care if he shoots two for 11. He's a gamer. Okay. He'll take the big <laughs> shot. Agreed. You, the value that you have on defense for him, people can't see because people just care about fantasy points, Okay. <laughs> This Marcus is, this is Smart. a very pro Marcus Smart podcast. Yeah. We're very, very much in agreement so, with you on these things. But if I had my choice of who would I rather have Ben Simmons running the point or Marcus Smart, I would take Ben Simmons and I am a Marcus Smart huge fan. Okay. But Ben Simmons makes three times as much money. I think I, that's, I, that's the issue. I, I guess just, just in a vacuum. Right. Yeah. I, I get right, that. Yeah, I'm, yeah. We're just talking about right. the kind of players. Teams, yeah. Right. If Jalen Brown and, and Tatum are going to coexist on the Celtics team, you need a guy that is a quarterback general. Mm-hmm. Chris Paul, Ben Simmons, you know, they had an opportunity to get Drew Holiday. I mean, we had an yeah, opportunity. But to get- Drew Holiday's not, he's not that guy on offense. He's more similar to a Marcus Smart. He can play point guard, but he's I, he's I, not I, really I, a point I get it. I get it. I think it. the you bigger issue is after Chris Paul. That how many guys like that are left? Point guards come up. They want to be Steph Curry, uh, not, no, not no. Jason Kidd. I mean, Kyle Lowry's like, out there. You could bring kinda, in kind of, but Kyle he's another Lowry guy. He, he's out of our price range. I mean, again, and he's 35 years old and he's looking for 30 million a year. Like, yeah, I get what you're saying. They're just he's not gonna get there. That. Honestly, aren't that many guys out there that play that way anymore. Yeah. All these point guards want to shoot threes, which I mean, ideally, it's someone who also can hit threes, but. Chris Paul, I, I mean, he's kind of the last of a dying breed. That's why I, I personally enjoy watching him. I was rooting for him. I loved seeing that run because after him, like there just aren't a lot of guys who play that way in the NBA anymore. So I'm with you. I'd love a guy like that. Um, and if we could find like a cheaper version, maybe like Ricky Rubio, I think is kind of like a poor man's version of that. Go back in my Twitter line. I've wanted Rubio since he first became available way back when. <laughs> yeah. Punch up Dakota and Rubio. You'll see my timeline. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but I mean, I think we're, we're, we're all yeah. barking up the same tree here. I think for too long. So, so again, when you go back to like the fit issue of Brown and Tatum, I actually think when the Celtics were playing their best basketball last season, which was a very small sample size, it was at the very beginning of the year when Smart was the point guard and Brown and Tatum both were playing like all-stars. And I think the problem with that, with that, their on-court fit was actually Kemba coming back because, again, I think they all kind of tried too hard to make it fit and you saw almost that, like, awkward transfer of power where it's like, is this still my team? And it's Kemba's like, am I the number two? Is Jalen right. the number yeah. two? Hey. I think it, the problem was more there. I think you go in with clear defined roles, Brown or uh, Tatum on offense is your one. Well, your one a Brown is your one B there's more than enough shots for it to go around. I mean, I still think this is the best way to build an NBA championship is with two elite two way wings. And that's what these guys are on pace to be. I mean, I don't think it the, the fact that Tatum isn't like a rah rah leader, it doesn't bother me too much in this day and age. You look yeah, around I, the NBA, I, I like a, I don't need a rah rah leader, but you know, when you're watching NBA, like when you watch mm-hmm. Kawhi Leonard, he's not a rah rah guy. It, well, exactly. You know, you know, Kawhi, the, Kawhi is taking it on the court and, and putting his effort. There were too Definitely. many times last year, and I don't know if they just all checked out because of Brad. I mean, I wanted the Celtics to blow it up mid season, I was calling for it. I went on one of my rants about, you know what? This is on Wick now, right? Brad couldn't fix it. Danny couldn't fix it. And then I basically called out Wick and said, Wick, now it's on you. It's on the ownership. I can't get mad at Brad anymore. And I can't get right, mad right. at Danny. Wick, you well, need to see this. And I, and I mean, obviously they did see it because look what happened. But I think right. that all kind of t- comes around full circle that we keep talking about Kawhi. 
here we have Udoka coming in who was there yeah. for Kawhi's growing up. And I mean, I think that's kind of the hope that some of that Spurs culture will come over to Boston. Tatum and Brown will look at this guy and say, wow, he's done it. He's played in the league. He's coached in the league. He was there with Kawhi. He helped him become a star. Udoka was supposedly the guy last year in Brooklyn who got, you know, Harden to buy in and, and play his role to make that work. So again, I mean, Tatum's just turned 23. Brown is, is a just 25 or not even maybe like these guys in, if you go by NBA history, there shouldn't be in their primes for a few more years. So I think right. we're on the right path. I mean, stay the course as much as possible. I don't think we need to make some crazy move. Definitely not a move just to appease Tatum who again, he can't even do anything. Even if he w- was angry and wanted to play with Beal that bad, it's, he, his max extension doesn't even start until this season. This is the first year of no. four before he can even opt out. Yeah. So, I mean, to think that, again, I know this is, your, I understand the frustration because people on Twitter, sometimes you just, you got to tune it out. But I don't think that's anything the Celtics are really considering. Again, I think if there's a way that Beal comes to the Celtics, It's basically that he decides he wants to play with Tatum and he's going to make it work and kind of dictate that move, whether it's telling the Wizards or making it clear to the rest of the league that, hey, because his contract after this year, he can opt out. So if he makes it clear, I'm only re-signing with these teams or whatever. If it's something like that, kind of what happened with Harden and the Rockets, and he kind of bends them over a barrel and makes it clear, like almost dictating where he goes, then I think there's a way the Celtics can get him without giving up Brown. And if we can do that, great. We've got our big three. Yeah. I mean, we'll want to come in here. We're a legit contender. My, my, right nar- my narrative would have changed. Okay. If Brown is not the guy that goes there because right. I'd be crazy. Right. Not mm-hmm. to say, wait a minute, I get to keep Tatum, keep right. Brown and bring in Beal. I'm not effing stupid. Okay. <laughs> well, and to me, that's the about, only way it works. Yeah. It was not, who knows? Who knows right. what yeah, way? Who, know, who knows? Because right. at the end of the day, Ted Leonsis, he's a great <laughs> owner. Okay, I've had conversation because I I, I see him in Vegas. I, he travels with the team. I've had conversations with him back when Beal was brought up years ago, and he says we love Beal so much that I will never let him go if it was up to me. So Beal is so well respected mm-hmm. in Washington at the owner level, I find it hard that they're going to be able to let Beal go. They'd rather appease Beal. And this is, this is another reason why I'm like, if they're going to appease Beal, why don't you appease them by go getting Tatum? Offer us the farm. Offer them us those pieces. Okay, but Beal. like you already said, that's not going to happen. I know it's not, it's not going to happen. So, but so. so, but I agree with your point. So if they want to appease Beal, which I agree to like, if, the only way this happens, because well, they've been great to Beal, and Beal has been great to Washington. But if it's just at that point where he's like, look, right. I want to win. It's not happening here. I think Washington has enough respect that they would allow him. You know, they're not just going to trade him to the highest bidder and say, yeah. have fun in Sacramento. or for You know what I mean? If he tells them, like, hey, I really want to go to Boston, then I think we have a good chance to get him for – I don't, a below market deal where we just make the money work, whether that's Al, whether it's yeah. like Tristan and Marcus, and then just say, you have every first round pick, you know, like I yeah. said, it's kind of the hardened package, take our next four first round picks with the pick swaps in between something like that. And then we have those three, whoever's still left, but you know, hopefully at least one of like Marcus and Rob, and then we just fill the roster with vets and rookies And then that's like your contender. You've got three guys, two still getting better and one in his prime right now. To me, like that would be the goal. But I think we're all in agreement. Just moving Brown for Beal is more of a lateral move. I mean, I think could Tatum and Beal with the right pieces around them win the title? It's possible. Like if things shake the right way, I mean, look at all the craziness we just saw in the NBA playoffs. I don't think anyone thought that that Phoenix team or, you know, the Bucs, it didn't look like they were exactly on a collision course for the finals. Phoenix Until it happened. Phoenix. I don't know. Phoenix won what? Eight in a row to finish off in the bubble. That team was starting to gel at the end of last year. And then they go out and have the best record in the NBA this year by adding Paul. Chris Paul. So I think, I don't think Phoenix came out of complete nowhere. Did, well, but they did didn't they even make help? the playoffs for the last 10 years. I mean, 
they got Chris Paul. I get what you're saying. They were moving in the right direction. I think people thought they'd do well, but I think saying that there was a difference people when they got Chris Paul, I think were like, Oh, they could make the playoffs. I don't think a lot of people were saying, Oh, that team's going to make the finals. They obviously proved it throughout the course of the season, but I'm still, I think overall, like the run, if you go back to the start of the season, more came out of nowhere. Yeah. So to close the thing and here's where like, I'm pausing one second. So after the whole, it was it yesterday, the day before, um, the Beal speculation came up. I did send off an email to Ted, the owner. And <laughs> yeah. usually, usually mm-hmm. he's very quick, very quick to respond. He has not responded to the Tatum Beal discussion yet. <laughs> so part of me says, wait a minute, is something really going on with Beal? Maybe not to the Celtics, but usually yeah. in the past, it's, I, I get an email back if I, if, if, about it and he'll say one thing or the other. And he has not responded about the Beal question about if they're moving him or whatever. So there may be something going on with Beal maybe going to be moved, but. So here's, here's what I think. And this is no inside information, but that, that what you just said would, would probably add credence to this theory that I think they're genuinely kind of in limbo. Like, yeah. I don't think at all they want to move Beal. Um, I think they desperately would prefer to keep him to try to keep building. You know, I think they finished the season strong, push for the playoffs. I think they want to convince themselves they can add to the team and make a run. But I think they also are very wary of Beal coming in and requesting a trade. I think it's closer to happening, obviously, than it's ever been. I think they're nervous and I think things are like at a bubbling point right now. And I think with the draft tonight, they know that if it's going to happen, there's a lot better chance of it happening before tonight. Cause you look at a lot of those proposed Beal pick. I mean, the one you keep hearing is golden state because they've mm-hmm. got Wiseman, they've got the seventh pick and they've got the 14th pick. Yeah. Those picks, if they're going to make that trade, Washington wants the picks, right. not the players. As soon as those picks become actual players, the value of that package goes way down. And then Washington's like, well, yeah. we don't like those guys. And that deal is basically off the table. So I think that's why, And I forget who wrote the article, but someone who originally kind of broke the story that Beal was really considering it said that he knows that if this is something he's going to ask for, he has to do it before the draft. So I would imagine that, you know, Leontis and probably that whole organization is sitting there by their phones, almost like nervously saying, please don't ring because they don't want to hear from Beal. I think they would love to go into tonight thinking we have at least one more year to make this work with Bradley Beal, with Russell Westbrook. Um, you know, and then kind of quickly going into the guys you said, again, as we've said, that trade would never happen. I get, you're just trying to put Tatum and and Beal together. I share similar thoughts with you on Hachimura. Um, and it's funny because I don't know if you were, but I was up last night at two in the morning, watching Japan play Slovenia in Olympic ball and Rui's absolutely dominating. And I've been joking actually for years saying he is the next Giannis. Obviously, that's crazy, that is too funny because I can see it. I can see it. He, that's why I, I, say I, it. I love him as a prospect. I mean, if I know you, Nick if, doesn't agree, Nick is over there going, you know what? Well, you guys are off your rocker right now. I mean, that's not a real package for Jason Tatum. He'll probably never be as good as Tatum is right now, but he can be a really good player. If we could, on a separate note, if we could somehow bring in Hachimura to fit as the four. Yeah, And you could run out a team of Smart, Jalen, Jason, Hachimura, Fine, Rob yeah. Williams. I would love that. that. Like, I would absolutely love to bring in Hachimura as a third or fourth guy. As a centerpiece in a Tatum we'd deal? Closer to this right Absolutely here. not. <laughs> closer to that. Closer to the banner. No, we would. I, I would love to see that. And, I mean, he's got this year coming up, and then uh, they'll have a decision whether they want to pay him or not. He'll be, I think, a restricted free agent. So, if if listen, if Rui Hachimura is available without giving up, one of our elite, one of our best players, like I would absolutely take him in a heartbeat. I don't know why yeah. Washington would want to move him if they're going to rebuild, but Hey, that's another story. Um, yeah. it was as wh- for Davis wh- Bertans. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, I, I agree with what you, what you said, but I just think the contract, they just overpaid him so badly. He's got four more years at 16 and 17 million for a guy who's really done nothing except shoot. And like you said, didn't even shoot particularly well last year. So I, I, it's just the contract. If he was making half that, I get what you mean. I, I totally want, a, we need a sniper, uh, but I, yeah, I don't know if you can afford to pay him that much. And then Thomas Bryant, 
like you said, coming off the ACL, who knows, that would kind of just be like another Robert Williams situation, perhaps. So yeah. all in all, I mean, the package is not nearly enough for Tatum, but I kind of like the the players on a, in an individual uh, That's basis. That's funny. You might have been one of the only ones in that can see the potential in Rui because nobody else does. So. I do love Rui. I've been joking about that for a while. Um, yeah. Big fan of his. If he is available, if the Wizards don't see it, the Celtics should absolutely yeah. be uh, so, trying to bring him in, just not for Tatum. So, to play so let him. me ask you this question. One of the things during the season when they were trying to figure out how to improve the Celtics team and they were talking about trading Jalen Brown, there was one trade that I threw out there that to me made the most sense for both teams. Unfortunately, I don't know if it's going to happen now because of what happened in Atlanta with the run that they went on and they might want to bring back that team because they were close. And that was trading Brown to Atlanta and getting a package that included Collins back because Collins wanted out. He is, he would be a better fit on this Celtics team as being that for that doesn't host that throw up a lot of threes and you not, you need to start putting chemistry around. And there was two guys that I think from an age standpoint that would work And Hey, listen, Jalen Brown's from Atlanta. You send him home. He's a huge activist back there. I think Brown would welcome a move to Atlanta if he was going to be traded and you say, Jalen, where would you want to be traded to? He'd probably say Atlanta. Right. Yeah. I just, I think I value um, Brown's skill set so much more than Collins. I get what you mean about fitting, but I think the, the days of having a power forward who doesn't really stretch the floor and doesn't really protect the rim. Um, I love Collins as like more of an ancillary guy. And that's where yeah. I think that's why he looks so great in the playoffs. It's a third or fourth option. I love him, but if you're bringing him in, I mean, he's going to, he's about to get paid it ton of money and in that scenario he'd be our number two option and again i just i think that's more of a lateral move i get what you mean about kind of roster construction but i think in this day and age the more versatile wings you have the better and i mean tatum and brown can play two through four i think the problem they need more guys like that and obviously that's why they traded for evan fournier and i think they still need more wings i mean that's what they're hoping neesmith becomes that's what they're hoping langford becomes so i mean i like collins i just think he's gonna get paid too much money, frankly, for what, for what he so does. What? It's not our money, right? As long as <laughs> well, can... no. But I mean, we need money to fill out the rest of the no, roster. But so I I'm get saying that, if, right? Who's if your they're... third guy? If you okay. trade Brown for it's, Collins, it's up to that. Well, no, it was going to be. I, I wanted Bago in that deal too. It wasn't going to be hmm. straight up because okay. Collins wanted out. So you can't get if somebody wants out, you 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 got to get a discount on him. So Embargo at the time, don't forget, was not playing that well. Hurt. And Gallinari was hurt too. And now they had to figure out. Wait a right. minute, how do we play both Bago and Gallinari? So to me, it was a way to solve my out my three-point shooting and get Bago in here and then get a banger okay. that could play for the defense. So that was my okay. that was my thinking with the Jalen Brown. Can we uh, can we throw Cam here. Reddish in there? I love, <laughs> I, I, I love Cam Reddish. And you know who else that I loved at the beginning of the season? Herder. Bo Portis. I mentioned it even on my uh, time. <laughs> I wanted yeah. Bo Portis. He was, he, he, the Knicks wanted he to get was rid of him. He was very available. Bad. I know and, it. And if you look at him when he played with Chicago, you get these players yeah. that are stuck on these bad teams and right. they make them appear a lot worse than they are. Well, that's, I mean, that's the, the DeAndre player. Ayton c- t- conversation it comes yeah. back to. You put these guys in the right role. Man, everyone in the NBA is pretty damn good. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, Portis, he's another guy. He, he's going to get paid. Milwaukee will probably have a hard time keeping him because he played yeah. so well. And whatever you do, I do not want Evan Fournier here. I didn't okay. like him. In, I did not huh. like him in Orlando. I don't like him here on the Celtics as this team is constituted right now. Because if you bring back Evan Fournier, I just don't think that moves the needle again. I just think it gives you another potential guy that can put the ball in the hoop. And his defense was terrible, by the way. He played terrible. <laughs> That's defense. hard to argue, yeah. Yeah, but uh, in his defense, I think there is no the, defense for defense. Uh, no, well, no, no, no. No, the de- you're either the a defense, good defender or you're not. Right, and he's not. Are we a, using he's COVID not as a defense? very good defender, but no, not even COVID as a defense. More the fact that he went from the defense Steve Clifford was playing with the Magic to what Brad Stevens was playing for the Celtics. Doesn't matter. It, well, does no, it, matter. Do, it does matter because okay, there was so a lot of times. Me, hold on, time out, time out. You're telling me if Marcus Smart gets traded to some other team, he's gonna you're gonna be concerned about obviously, Marcus Smart. Obviously defense? not Marcus Smart. I mean, I'm saying the things, yeah, when Fournier is stuck on an island with James Harden and he's getting cooked, there's nothing that scheme is gonna fix there. Well, but I mean, 
that's all right that's a lot of that's a lot of guys that's a lot of guys right but i'm saying for me there's so many times where you're watching and it's just breakdowns where you see two guys are going with the ball two guys are going with the cutter we're giving up an open layup a wide open corner three and it's just a lack of communication a lack of familiarity so that for me i don't want to judge fournier too harshly because the scheme was such a drastic change and i don't even think he probably got a chance to practice like his whole time in Boston. Again, if that's you're the one good, thing for me. I want to see it. If I you're a good defensive it. player, you're a good defensive player. That's it. You either know how to play defense or you don't. Okay, you're a good communicator. On ball, yeah. I, I don't know. I think there's a lot more to it no. in the there NBA. Is, there is no, in, no, there isn't. In the NBA, you're either a, you can be you can take a terrible defender and make him into a good team defender. That's that's what you could do. And okay. that's what I think they can do with Fournier. Oh, oh well, you could do that with anybody though. Mm, well, to an extent. Okay, yes, but I right. Okay, but I think what he provides on offense is is very he doesn't valuable. doesn't provide anything on offense. Oh, he come was on. A, he was a he, he shot scored. over 40% on 3 with the Celtics. Yeah, despite listen, how poorly he Dino, played in having Dino, Ra- Dino Raja was a great scorer on a terrible team. He was in Orlando <laughs> where they hoist up points all the time. Exactly. He, playing Orlando don't lock down Orlando because they know they're going to beat Orlando <laughs> you put right. them in a playoff scenario and you've got a guys that playing them lock them down and they scheme for you Fournier is not going to be able to score can he get hot yes Isaiah Thomas gets hot you can score it doesn't mean you can score consistently okay when you but, need. W- but the thing is Orlando was basically on asking <laughs> Right. Fournier, Orlando was basically asking Fournier to be their number one guy. The, the Celtics will be asking didn't him. didn't care about defense, Nick. Okay, that's why <laughs> Fournier got off. <laughs> the Celtics are asking Fournier to be their third or fourth guy, which is a role that I think, if anything, he's probably slightly overqualified for, especially if we're not bringing in another point guard to score the way like Kemba did and pressure the defense. The reality is we need a guy coming off the bench or at least another option when one of the Jays is sitting who can put some pressure on the defense. So I get not loving Fournier. My question is just, okay, if you're going to let him go, you got to bring in someone because right now there isn't another guy on the roster. Right, but that's money, as you would say, that you want to be well, right. your money. But that's when money the Celtics are already well. over the cap, their best option is to use the bird rights to retain Fournier and then figure it out from there. Then they can at least have that twenty million cap spot to trade. If well, they let him go, Danny, for they have nothing Danny to show Andrew's for. Fired. This is why Danny Ainge is fired because <laughs> he messed it up with the Haywood situation. Because well, the value of losing Haywood in his cap slot hurt them more than anything else. Okay, he re-signed Haywood and then traded him. We could, well, we could definitely go back and relitigate a lot of the past. I totally agree. I'm, I, but I mean, given the situation they're in now, I think unless the price gets too crazy and nick and i have talked about what that price is for us the line is basically 20 million we agreed on if you can bring him back at under 20 million a year i think you do it just because that's a valuable people will want that contract even if you're worried about you're worried about you're worried about birch hands making 16 million a year who i know (laughs) does one thing exception well knock down threes in the nba and a guy like fournier who has not proven that he can do one thing really well fournier shot better on threes last year than bertans did yeah, and, and Marcus he, Smart shot 39%, 40%. Does that mean he's, a, he's, a, he's one of the top three-point shooters in the league? I mean, I think Fournier is a guy who can create his own shot. Bertans is a pure catch-and-shoot three-point shooter. He's a much worse defender than Fournier. He doesn't rebound. He doesn't I, pass. I, Fournier I, is I a almost, good I, offensive player. He, he can he, drive. Okay. He gets to the free-throw line a lot. He can make shots off I, the dribble. He's a, he's a good, lot better on offense than Bertans. I would say... Fournier would be a good guy off the bench. That's what yeah, he did. and that's <laughs> what we ideally got him to be. He was thrust into a bigger role because I'm injury. not giving him twenty million to be off the bench. Sorry, I'm not doing that. I don't well, think we have a choice. Uh, yeah, I, well, maybe I not. Think, yeah, <laughs> maybe right. Not. <laughs> I think that's the issue. I don't. Maybe. I don't love it. And I mean, I think the initial reports was something more like fourteen million. If we can get him at fourteen million, I'd love that. I think yeah, the, that's that's, that's just, not happening anymore though. That's just the going rate. I mean, you're going to have to pay 17, 18 well, million for forget, these guys. This, the it is what it is. Cap, the NBA salary cap mm. has been trending down. And it's one and it's one of the reasons why they decided again to go with the extended playoffs that play in game is because the mm. salary cap a lot of it is based off of the revenue that they get from the playoffs. And this I, I brought this up I think 3 4 years ago 
when Golden State was going through all these teams in Cleveland, they were sweeping. It was eliminating all the <laughs> playoffs right. of money that the, the league made their cap number based on. So the, the NBA looked at, mm -hmm. you know what? We have too many teams that aren't getting the six and seven games. We're losing those playoff, that playoff money, that extra revenue that affects the cap. That's why they're like, all right, we need to have now these play-in games. We need to make up for these, these series that aren't going long enough. And so that's why the play-in series is sticking again is because the NBA is in cap hell. And again, with the ratings down, that means their future contracts for TV rights aren't going to be as good. You need to be more frugal now, I think, with contracts than anything else. So to me, you need to be cognizant to that fact about the NBA salary cap. And kind of like what Belichick did of understanding where the cap room is and like being an advantage in case there is a big shift. I think the Celtics should start thinking about that as well, because the Celtics might put themselves in a better position financially. So when the caps get, keep getting adjusted, we might be able to get someone that we couldn't have or can't go elsewhere because of the cap limitations that are coming up. Sure. And I, and I, I think, well, I think the cap will go up in a few years. I think it's two or three more years. The new TV deal kicks in, which they've already made, which is, is going to make it go up. Um, I get what you're saying. It's, it's not going up at the rate that it was. I mean, I certainly don't think the cap itself is going to go down. But either way, I agree with you. And the thing is, the Celtics are in a precarious situation right now where they have to decide. Um, and I mean, a lot of this goes back to Beal because he's the guy who's going to be a free agent in a year. Do the Celtics kind of take a year off and decide we're not truly going to contend? And then the idea is to clear cap space so that we can be in play for a max free agent? Or do we build out the best roster we can now around Tatum, Brown, et cetera. Like, I think those are kind of, we're at a bit of a crossroads where it's- So you'd decide. have to, you'd, for that scenario, which, mm -hmm. you know what, if, if they came out and said, here's our plan. Our plan is to stay the course, try to rebuild, get cap flexibility. I think as a Celtics fan, I'm okay with that. Give me a plan, right? Give us a plan. And I just, it's just a smart, lot to hope for. There's no guarantee that we're going to get that guy. No, because you know what ends up happening? oh my God, the Celtics are now the number two seed. They have a shot this year. Then all of a yeah. sudden they make a trade to bring somebody <laughs> in that hurts their cap flexibility and they don't win an NBA title. Right. And then they go, what happened to the plan? Where's yeah. the plan? Where's right. the plan? Or, or like you said, we had the plan with Kyrie. The plan was to trade for Anthony Davis. And then he basically yeah. comes out and says, don't trade for me. Yeah. <laughs> so plans are tough. And that's why it's like when you've got stuff here, it's hard to just let Evan Fournier walk because we hope we'll get Bradley Beal in a year. Yeah, you, know, you can't, no you can't worry that about that. Happen. Beal, Beal might have a knee injury next year. Who knows? Right. Sure, yeah, right. You know. Or maybe he'll get traded to Golden State and love it and sign a five-year max extension there and that'll be over. Like, you don't know what's going to happen. And I mean, the same out with Damian Lillard, who's even older. He's thirty, about to be 32 yeah, I, years I old. Is that a guy you're mortgaging Damian the future I don't want for? If I have to give up Brown for any of these 20, late 20s, early 30 scores, they're mm. not going to move the needle for me. They're not. I don't want I I love Damian Lillard, but I don't want him here if I have to give up Jalen Brown. Totally agree. Yeah, we talked about that in the last on the last podcast, yeah. too. Yeah. We, we talked about Beal and Lillard, and I just don't think – we don't think it makes sense with the you – know, It just doesn't fit the timeline. Jaylen. Those are guys who make more money. They're both worst defenders, and they're not getting any younger. Yeah, and they're on. They're on team. There's a reason they want out because they can't win as <laughs> as the main guy already. So, right. yeah, I think uh, I think all right. So other than the outlandish uh, Tatum trade proposal, we're actually I think <laughs> all generally on the same page here, which is surprising. So, so you're saying you don't want Fournier back? It, so like I don't, I don't want him back. Okay. Under any circumstance. I, I, I don't want the guy. I don't want him here. I don't care if they got a deal on him. I, I don't want him back. Okay, I, don't but... think, I don't think he fits. Now, don't forget, I'm going on the premise mm. that Tatum and Brown are on this team next year. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay? Which I, I think, think they have a fair other, assumption. I think they have other needs to utilize that dollar, even though they have his bird rights. and they Well, the thing, that's the thing. They don't have that dollar. They're still over the cap. That's the only reason they can sign well, him. They it's not like they can, they can do a sign and trade with him. But okay. Yeah. If he agrees to that, yeah. I mean, yeah. Oh, okay. All right. But so then I guess, <laughs> I guess the point is they, they do need to sign him, even if it's to trade him. Like okay. they can't just let him we walk can't lose him for, for nothing. nothing. So let me ask you this question, Kyle Lowry. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Yeah. Kyle, Ra- Kyle Lowry at the age he is, if mm-hmm. he could play here next year, oh, and they could him, would, you, would you take him? I'd take him in a heartbeat. The Absolutely. problem is he is going to make so much money. He's the okay. premier free agent on the market, and teams are about to spend like crazy. I, the Knicks know. are going to give him $30 million a year. The Pelicans just made that trade with Memphis literally so they could make sure that they could offer him $30 yeah. million a year. I, I, I'm, it's going to happen. I, I'm telling I'm you. Using, I'm kind of using him as an, as an example in a situation where if, you're, if Fournier is going to command $20 million, let's call it. Nick, you mentioned $20 million, right? Yeah. 20 and you worked, out, you worked out a deal for a sign and trade with to get a guy like Lowry you could match Fournier and someone else to bring in Kyle Lowry for a couple of years at that being you're probably going to give him three years whatever right and then that yeah. third year is the waste year which I'm okay with because if you tell me I got two years of Kyle, Low- Kyle Lowry which watching the rest of the Celtics team mature I'm okay with that but because he, he we know what we're going to get he's a he's a floor general which the team needs. I think you could do a sign and trade with Fournier. Maybe you have to give up like a Neesmith or something like that. You showed some promise. Someone that they like on the other side that has some upside that can be is NBA ready. I think Neesmith can do that if he had the time. But that's all I'm saying. We use um, Fournier for a sign and trade to use okay. that money to bring someone in. I don't, I'm, I'm like generally with that idea. I'd obviously would rather have Kyle Lowry than Fournier if that's a possibility. I just think the market is going to be too rich for Lowry. Maybe well, how much is Conley going to get? How much? I, is well, I was literally just going to say maybe Mike Conley is a good plan because I think he's almost as good as Lowry, but probably won't command as much. Oh, wait, it I, seems I, like the Jazz are intent on keeping him. Oh, Conley to me, I'd give Conley the thirty million. I wouldn't. Argue. Conley can't stay on the court though. Well, you know, I mean, I don't know. I'd rather take a younger Conley than an older Kyle Lowry. But I, I even think despite the age, Lowry's proven to be a lot more durable. Yeah. I, I, either guy. I mean, I think a guy like that, those would both be great fits. I just don't buy that they'll – unfortunately, I just don't think they'll be that available. I've got I don't think one, they're realistic options for us. I, I've got yeah. one, one sleeper that I don't know if the Celtics would have interest in him, but I've always liked him since his days on the Atlanta Hawks when he came up. Dennis Schroeder, okay? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think he is Rondo-like that can score, like is a shooter. He is that type of guy. Yeah. He's a good on-the-ball defender. He has – I has think that German Rondo a, was his nickname. Yeah, he has that type <laughs> A mentality of being a, a floor general. He has He's type A. You need a quarterback yeah. to be type A. You have to. No, I'm with you. I like Schroeder, and I think that – um. I think he was judged unfairly this year on the Lakers because sure. their floor spacing with Drummond Davis and LeBron was an absolute disaster. Yeah. And there was just no way for Schroeder to do what he does and, and break down the D get to the lane, which made him look worse. I'm with you again. Uh, I sent a report to Nick yesterday, actually in a text that uh, someone reported the Knicks are prepared to offer Schroeder four years a hundred billion. Wow. So um, million if that's, year. I mean, yeah. I so if that's the case, obviously million that's million. not going to happen. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think again, we're, we're all on the same page here of the kind of player the Celtics need um, a point guard who can score, but is more of, like you said, a floor general can play defense. Um, you know, like again, kind of like hopefully with a, with given that role, Marcus smart can just become that but someone who's probably more of a pure point guard can set up Jalen and Jason and put them in a better position to succeed where it doesn't seem like they're, they have such a giant offensive burden. And so many of the times it feels like we're just giving the ball to Tatum or Brown and saying, okay, save us, you know, make the, make the play, do everything. Well, they need an, another guy to put them in, in a position to succeed. I think the bigger issue is again, the guys we just named are, are going to be very hard to get. And there just aren't that many guys like that out there. The point with Fournier, I think, is that we just can't lose him for nothing. That's that's really what it comes down to. And if it comes down to losing him for nothing or resigning him, then I'm resigning him. That I agree with. That I agree with because yeah. you could still trade him next year. Well, right. And, yeah. and if if someone like say next year, it's a tradable uh, contract say, even at twenty well, million. Right. That's what I was gonna say. If like the Beal thing reaches a boiling point at the trade deadline, you know, maybe it gets past the draft, but the Wizards start awful. And at the trade deadline, they decide to move him. We're going to need those middling contracts to make the money work. Fournier could be a centerpiece we throw in with, yeah. you know, 20 well, first round picks. That's been one of our problems for the last, you know, however many years that we haven't had middling contracts to make trades. Right. So, I mean, 
everybody's floating all these trade rumors around. And then, you know, we have either people making 5 million or, you know, 30 million. So yeah. having someone in that 15 to 20 million range is, you know, very important when it comes to making trades, especially for, yeah. you know, people like Beal, people making that, you know, 30 million. Yeah, I think unless the price tag gets crazy, um, we got we to gotta bring Fournier back. If we can sign and trade him for a guy who fits even better, that'd be great. But uh, we can't just lose him. We, we need, we would, you know, I'm not saying he's the difference in making us a contender or not, but without that kind of sixth man or that kind of third or fourth creator, shooter, slasher, whatever you want to call him, we'd be in big trouble. And we'd be counting on, a big, big step from uh, at least one of the kids. You don't want another we'll twenty happens, million dollars <laughs> trade exception for him, like uh, another Hayward trade exception. Yeah, I guess then we're bringing back uh, Ojale to be the sixth man again. So. <laughs> Good old semi. Good old semi. Semi, one of the All right. recruits coming out of high school, went to Duke and realized he, he wasn't going to the court. Went to SMU. Yeah. And to me, I he was a stud at SMU. And I, I'm I love the pick. A lot of people don't. I just thought Semi could be, yeah. if he was given the regular minutes and regular rotations, I think he had the potential to be another Jay Crowder. He could have been. He, he could. Could've. I thought. I thought the same. He. Yeah. The, the, I just haven't seen the progress, the improvement that well, I would have well, liked they, to you, on the margins. How do you get progress when you go out and play 16 minutes one night and then you keep, don't even get off the court because Brad Stevens was trying to find something that everybody could gel with. You can't. You yeah. need, you need no, I think that was a problem for a lot of the, for a lot of the kids yeah. for sure. Well, that's on um, Danny from having all these guys, well, right. all exactly. these draft picks because you have to find time for them. Yeah. No, I, uh, I don't disagree. Like I said, we could sit here and relitigate the past for uh, hours and hours. I'm sure. Um, Days. Let's hit a, a, a couple other, I guess, off season questions. Um, three guys who have one year left on their deal um, and are all at, very different points in their career, but uh, a decision probably has to be made sooner than later. And that's what would you do with Marcus Smart, Robert Williams, and Tristan Thompson, um, where the options are you could either let them all ride out to next year, see how this year goes, and then see what they get on the open market, which could obviously go poorly or really well. Uh, you could deal them now as expiring contracts, see what you can get back. Uh, a lot of options here. Nick and I have talked about this a bit. Dakota, what would you do with those guys? Or what's what's kind of your ideal scenario? So, I mean, as it relates to Thompson, I mean, he, he was yeah. a good piece. He's a fit. I think they're a dime a dozen. You can go, you can replace him very easy. I think mm-hmm. they were trying to get um some a, a senior guy in the in the locker room. You got Al Horford now coming back. You don't yeah. need Thompson. Um, so to me, Thompson's probably out there demanding a trade to some. I think contender. he's your obvious trade piece. You know, let him go. Um, but I don't mind him being here another year either. I just think the team had so many warts on it last year mm-hmm. with probably, you know what? The Celtics probably knew Brad was leaving, uh, not going to coach last year, and they checked out. You know, that's what's unfair. That was unfair yeah. to the fans, right? We heard yeah. rumors how he was going to the Indiana back to college. Yeah, I guarantee those were probably true. He probably accepted an offer by mm-hmm. Indiana because you had alumni coming out saying it was done. So they were probably told that Brad agreed. He went back to Celtics ownership and says, no, listen, ride out the season. We'll move you up. And then if the opportunity comes in, I guarantee that happened. Like there is uh, no way, yeah. no way the faculty and ex-athletes at Indiana Hoosiers would come out and ever say that Brad was going. We heard it that day and we all woke up. And then Brad addressed the team at six o'clock that afternoon, held the press conference. And we all said at that point, well, he's probably just going to squelch the Romans. No, he probably said, Hey, I was offered a job. I decided not to take it. And the team, no, the team knew yeah. they were writing on the wall. And that's why we showed the Celtics the second half of the year did not care because they mm-hmm. knew that they were trying that you, a lot of NBA players, they play for either themselves for the team or the coach. Mm-hmm. Okay. And you didn't have players on the Celtics team playing for the coach. You didn't have them playing for the team. You had everybody playing for themselves. And that's because they knew Brad Stevens was not going to be the coach next year. The writing was on the wall and they should have fired him mid season. And the whole Perkins thing, go check the timeline before even Kendrick Perkins mentioned the whole Tatum thing. I said that Perkins should go into, they should hire Perkins to come out of the booth and be on the bench for the second half of the year. You could say no, he's not going to long-term <laughs> solution. Yeah. But at that point in time, I would have rather seen a new rejuvenated Celtics team hmm. with the talent that was there, 
with the kind of a healthy Kemba that was coming back, okay, to take a shot at the playoffs. And who knows if that Celtics team last year could have gelled a little bit better. They might have yeah. had a shot of doing something in the playoffs. And unfortunately, we were robbed. Celtics fans were robbed of a season because they kicked the can to the end of the season when they knew they were getting rid of Brad Stevens. They should have done it in the middle of the season, and they didn't want to do it. Anyway, yeah. I know I went off on a no, tangent. I, 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 I kind of I do agree to an extent. And I think as much as the Stevens thing, it was the weirdness of, of the COVID year. Like, I think there are a lot of reasons to say last year was just an outlier. I, hate, I honestly hate the COVID excuse. I really do. I don't. I don't like as an excuse either, yeah. but I mean, I'm just mean the guys were in and out of the lineup every two seconds. So the was, schedule. So was, so was the rest of the NBA. The NBA was the same way. I agree. I'm okay, just saying. So, so no, no, no. I'm just saying. Excuse? Huh? What was Milwaukee's excuse? They had to deal with COVID. They had guys in and out of the lineup. Giannis had to sit during game. Oh, Chris Middleton uh, <laughs> sat. I'm like, no, no, no. That? I'm not saying it's like an extra excuse that the Celtics should have won at all. I just mean when people are like analyzing the Celtics and what they have, I look at more the last three years before that and what we were building. And I don't think that the two conference finals appearances are an outlier. I think last year was more of the outlier. And no, again, just, as much okay. as COVID it's Jalen Brown is injured for the playoffs. We don't have our second best player in the playoffs. Like granted there were problems all throughout the year, but we just had no continuity with our actual best players. You, you, we said were, we were, you said the Celtics were building something going in the, into the season. I would yeah. say they were building a bomb that just got blown up, okay? Because <laughs> we saw what happened with chair. We heard with chairs being thrown, okay? And many times over the previous season, it wasn't just the COVID season. The season before, we heard of all the in-team in fighting with that team. And now the excuse was, well, the team, the players don't have to get along to be a championship, which is true. If you have mature players in that locker room, you can fight and not get along. The Celtics were very young. And the problem mm -hmm. is when you have fighting and disagreement in that locker room, young, mature players get affected more than anything. So what happened this year was a culmination of everything that led up to the previous two or three years. And it finally reared its head where they said, that's it. And we're going to hit the reset button, which I'm glad they, glad that they did. As it relates to the other guy, I mean, we, we are agree on Thompson. You mentioned Marcus Smart. I could go either way with Smart. I love him. But again, show me what the plan is. If Smart's not here, what are you bringing in defensively to offset that? And what are you doing just to bring in someone that cares as much as, you know, the heart and soul? So. Yeah. And, and he's a good trade chip. I'm, I'm sure you put him on the Lakers, right? If you put Marcus Smart on the Lakers. Don't even say that. That's blasphemy. I'm, I'm just saying. Like, you <laughs> no, put I Marcus know. Smart in that Lakers every team, team? Every team would love to have a Marcus Smart. It, yeah. Celtics and, uh, fans do not appreciate what they have, um, yeah. and who is unfortunately. The third, who is the third person? That you Robert met? Williams. Oh. Who has one. He's, so, it's going to be time I mean, to make a decision. I'm on the Time Lord fan. I mean, when the guy is healthy, he is a yeah. difference maker in the Definitely. court. Definitely. So and, what, what would you consider a fair number right now for an extension? How much a year would you offer him knowing what we know? Well, because of the injuries. Right. I mean, but I mean, that's, that's the risk you run. You wait, you want to wait it out till this year and see if he can prove it. Okay. But if he does prove it, you're going to have to pay so him a lot be, of money. Is he going to be a restricted free agent or unrestricted? Yeah. he would be restricted. So then I'd wait it out. I'd wait out another year. See what see, the, See I try to get an goal. extension done now. If you can get something done at like four years, 44 million, something oh, in the low oh, teens. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So oh, I mean, well, I mean that, that's yeah. what it's going to be. But I'm saying if you wait, if he stays yeah, no, healthy no, no. and keeps if, playing like he did this year, you're going to be looking at 20 million a year. If it's that cheap, if you're getting yeah. him 11 million, do it now. Do it yesterday. That's you what know, I'm that, saying. That, okay. That's definitely worth the risk in today's NBA, 11 yeah. million a year for a center, that if he stays healthy, he's could be dominant. And that could be absolutely. Value. Yeah. Okay. We're on the same page on that one. So, yeah, I mean, I would extend – I think the number on smart was something like around 15 a year for three or Perfect. four more years. I'd do that. Yeah. For yeah. Rob Williams, 11, 12, 13 a year, I would do that. I'd try to bring both of those guys back. And, again, Fournier, you hope to keep him under thir under uh, 20. If we could get him closer to 15, awesome. But, I like you said, I don't see any of the, those guys depreciating to a point where those at least wouldn't be valuable trade chips at sure. worst. Um, and ideally that's, you know, those are core guys on your roster. Um, 
So we're all pretty much in agreement. And then, yeah, Thompson, I'm with you at this point with Horford here. It's more just kind of the same problem we had at the start of last year where there's just too many big guys, not enough minutes. Thompson seems like probably the odd man out. And now he's got a $10 million expiring deal. So that he just seems like the obvious guy to get moved. But yeah, I'm with you. If um, it shakes out in a different way, like he's a, a, certainly a serviceable center. The, the players seem to like him, uh, despite what some <laughs> reports came out during the season. Uh, um, the players seem to say otherwise. So I think we're pretty much think- in agreement. Yeah, I do ahead. think we need to shop Tristan. Um, I think he, like we were saying, he has, he has, you know, people, good teams need a backup center like him. There's a lot of teams right now that could really, you know, use him right now. But I also do worry a little bit about our backup center position. I know we have, you know, Al, who hopefully will be, you know, around for most of the season. Um, and then Time Lord, if he can stay healthy. And then I know we just brought in, you know, Moses, but, if Time Lord, you know, can't stay on the court, then who's going to be our backup? Is it, are we really going to go to Moses Brown as our? Can he be a backup center for a good team? Uh, uh, so, I mean, like, Kelly remains Linick to might, be seen. Kelly might Kelly. be back here. Kelly Kelly is on my. Kel, Kelly is on my list. Kelly might have played his way out of our price range in Houston, but I, I we we were uh, last year we were begging we were hoping that after Kelly was traded, Houston would buy him out and we could actually bring him in here to replace like uh, I would have preferred him to like you know when we brought in Jabari Parker, yeah. but uh, anyway MVP so push. Quick, so quick so, story, quick yeah, story. Yeah, go ahead. Linux, though, so I golf quite a bit, and yep. I don't know if you guys golf, and usually in you know for, for us amateurs, you know you get a birdie. Right. And then after the birdie hole, you end up like double, triple bogey. right. right. So whenever I do a birdie, the next hole and with somebody, we just call it an Olenek, uh, you know, because <laughs> we had that 25 point game and then came out and had a <laughs> next day, you know, in the playoffs. So now if you're on the golf course, you get a birdie and you do it, you mess up it's the next hole. It's an Olenek. I like that. Hey, well, we'll always have game seven against Washington, right? Yep. Exactly. <laughs> Infamous. All right. So, um, Quickly, are there any – Nick and I have talked about this. Dakota, do you have any guys in mind that we haven't mentioned who you think might be options as trade targets beyond the stars who you keep hearing about? But any guys more on the margins who might be available, maybe even guys we could fit into the rest of that $10.5 million from the Gordon Hayward uh, TPE, or maybe just someone we could get back for Tristan Thompson? Um, the two names that I've mentioned that I think we could get yeah. are Kyle Anderson from the Grizzlies – and Larry Nance from the Cavs, two guys who are kind of threes slash fours and I think would be a really good fit as either our fifth starter or a sixth man type, uh, can shoot some threes, good defenders, um, a little do it all, but like don't need the ball. Yeah, I think I think I like Nance more than the other one. I, you know, Nance has been, you know, stuck obviously in Cleveland. Yeah. Um, I think I think athletic, he's a he's a freak athletically. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously remember his dad way back in the day, at of least course. I'm old enough to know, remember his dad <laughs> playing. Um, mm-hmm. so out of the two, I'd rather have Nance. Uh, I think he'd be a great, a, I wouldn't say great, a good seventh or eighth rotation guy on this team. And you need those guys. Yeah. Um, to me, who else might be out there that they can, I think a lot depends on what happens after this draft. Like I don't definitely. I think you you can find out who's able, like what the what are the pieces? Like I don't put it. Do you put it past you tonight that the Celtics don't figure out how to like get into the first round? Like some weird weird thing says they're gonna do something tonight <laughs> that slides into like the thirteenth or fourteenth or eighteenth pick somewhere around there and come out of left field. I kind of yeah. like have that feeling because nobody's expecting it, and maybe right. it's may, maybe it's my hindsight on wait a minute, Mitchell's slipping in the draft from Baylor. So if Mitchell's there at like 12 or 13, here's a guy that you can bring in. Um, yeah. And I don't know why he's slipping. I mean, it doesn't well, the reason sense. it's it's age is the reason he's already, he'll be 23 when the season starts. Yeah. I, I would, I'm not saying that's right, but I'm saying yeah. that is, that is the reason. You I know, mean, these I, scouts, I, they fall in love with the youth and the potential. If the guys, I, yeah. yeah, no, if, I agree. He'll go to a team probably like Golden State teams. and he'll he'll go on a good team and help them immediately. I'm yeah. With you. I mean, I, Brogdon is another guy that could potentially be available, but he's going to be. I could see that. I love Melton. 
We love Brogdon. Yeah, it's almost for me. It's it's getting to the point where Indiana seems so intent on dealing Brogdon that I'm worried. Maybe that body is just – he's headed for, for a complete breakdown. I mean, he's had injury history for a while now, and it's it's getting to the point where it's like, okay, why do they want to trade him so badly? Yeah. Uh, well, makes hey, me worry. bring up Jeff Teague. He's won a tight end. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Only God. Kidding, I don't want Jeff Teague on this season. <laughs> no, I mean, but, I mean, the reason yeah. I brought up Nance is because I think, like you said, perfect example where the Cavs it looks like we'll probably draft Evan Mobley tonight and then they could have Mobley Jared Allen at, at the two big spots with uh you know they drafted a Coro so yeah. it seems like Nance could be available someone like that but like you said we'll see how things shake out with the draft and then I think it'll be a lot more clear who's available um I think it's more likely that the Celtics trade for a player than a pick tonight um, would if if I, I were to so. go one way or the other? Um, can we get Covington? So, can I get Covington here? Well, I would love Covington. I, w- I would love him too. I don't know why Portland's going to part with him. Um, other guys he's, I had on my he's list been traded like, three different times, and why <laughs> well, they're not in the market for Covington? If <laughs> it, yeah, no, I mean I agree. He he keeps going for a lot somehow, but um, other Patrick guys Beverly, I had on my can list. Can I get Patrick Beverly here? Uh, well, I don't know. I think we need someone bigger than Beverly. Well, but I just, Beverly, I, just, I love defenders. I'm a def- defense. I'm with guy. you too. I think Beverly has just, he had a great playoff series against the Suns, but I think he's fallen off a lot the last couple of years. Um, other guys I had on my list, Tom, Tomas Sadoransky from the Bulls. He would fit the, uh, the Hayward TPE could be, he's been a really mm. solid uh, backup point guard. If we're not going to sign someone else, uh, Josh Richardson, who showed a ton of promise in Miami, was good for Philly. Disastrous Mm. year last year in Dallas. Um, He's someone who I think just blame it on COVID, right? We'll say Richardson (laughs) down here. Exactly. Now you're getting it. No, but he's he's someone I would take a chance on for like Thompson because the Mavs need a big center like that. You know, let's take a shot in the right role. We've you know if he can get back to that being a forty percent three point shooter and elite defender like he was with the Heat and like he showed signs of with Philly that would be optimal and we could get him on the cheap. Um, I threw in there cause it's just been almost funny how hard they're trying to move Kyle Kuzma. I don't know what it would take to get him, but my God, the Lakers are giving this guy away. Like he is some kind of disease. Um, he just doesn't fit with LeBron, obviously, you know, LeBron. exactly. Right. But if, if they're just giving him away, um, you know, I, he would be a great player off the bench for the Celts. Um, and I even saw this one yesterday. I don't know what you think about this. I sent it to Nick, but Jared Culver, the, the reports of the Timberwolves are looking to, to move Culver for a second round pick. That guy is still 21 years old. He was the number six overall pick only two years ago. Mm-hmm. I, I would let's give that guy a change of scenery for a second round pick. I mean, a big wing like that, that again was that high of a prospect that recently I'm willing to uh, like, let's let, I'd use the second round pick to try to get a guy like Culver rather than kind of starting over the process. Let's see if we can bring him in, um, you know, a change of scenery can do him some good. So, I mean, right. that was kind of my short list of guys who I think are, are <laughs> realistic uh, trade options that I think are available. Joe Ingles too. There's the jazz apparently are looking to dump some salary, probably in hopes to bring back Conley. It said that any of what's uh, Ingles making, Ten and a half million. So he, he, we could get him with the the TPE. It's just what, um, what would the Jazz want back from us? Um, so I mean, if maybe if we had a first, I think they want to probably move him for a first. Maybe if we could give him like a second round pick, and you know, maybe they like one of our kids. Maybe they like Pritchard can we, or Langford. Can we get Buddy or, Healed at all? Is Buddy Healed available? You he's know? extremely available, but again, three more years at about twenty two million. It's just going to be tough, tough to make it work. I think it, it would be the problem there. Um, I, I don't know. There, there's, a, It'll be interesting. There's a lot of guys who are going to be very available. The word on the street is that with kind of a down free agent class and nobody having cap space, there could be more moves this offseason than ever in terms of trades. Um, you know, the Celtics will be active. Uh, I'll, I'm, I'm looking forward to not hearing that we were, you know, runners up for every single superstar that gets traded immediately sure. after they get dealt. Yeah. That should be a nice, nice change of pace that hopefully Brad won't carry over. You know, in, um, in poker terms, right. If you're always, mm-hmm. you know, the second best hand in the, in, you know, the second best holding cards in the hand, you're going to lose. And you know, it's like Danny playing no limit, hold them. Right. <laughs> yeah. Come in second, oh, that's yeah. when you lose your chips. It's when you need to fold early on, you protect your chips. 
Danny coming in second to all these guys means that he's losing valuable chips. Yeah. Um, unfortunately that has been the case for, for, for too long. I'm afraid. Um, all right. Any, any other names you want to mention on either the trade market or the free agent market that uh, we've touched on a ton of free agents. I mean, it's all speculative. I think more, the point is we need more wings a backup point guard, guys who can shoot, guys who can play defense. Well, wait, from a backup point guard, mm-hmm. I like Pritchard as the backup. Yeah. And I think he could potentially move his way into a starting role. Potentially. I don't know. I think yeah. he I think he is a legit NBA backup point guard right now. Definitely. And oh, I agree. And I got a lot of shit. Can I say shit? Yeah, we're on a podcast, yeah. right? I got now. I was on the radio the other day, and they said I can't say shit. I go, why you can't? Say shit? I go, they we're say listed, prick. it's listed explicit on uh, Spotify, so you're good. Well, uh, they say prick all the time over the airways. Right. On yeah, radio. like how can I say prick? Like he's a prick, but I can't say like he played like shit. Like that doesn't make any sense to me. I'm anyway, with you. Yeah. So, oh, where was I going with this? Wait a minute. What was I? Backup um, point guard, yeah. Pritchard. Oh, yeah, yeah backup yeah. point guard. So. I mentioned this out, not sure how much you've seen in my timeline of last year, but Peyton Pritchard, when he played 20 minutes or more, mm-hmm. the Celtics were like 18 and six. It was like super weird that they had this really good record when Pritchard played 20 minutes or more. Go through right. the game logs. I forget what it was. I stopped keeping track of it. And everybody said, oh, you're crazy. He sucks. He sucks. Yeah. Like, There's something, there is something to a guy getting minutes and what they can do to equate to winning. There totally. is something that says that. And you and know who is something you know to, who was that guy before Pritchard? Huh? Before Pritchard, it was Rob Williams who had that stat. Oh, 100%. It was like going back the year before. It was like every time right. he plays 15 or more minutes, the Celtics win. Yeah. And but no, I, I'm, I'm with guy. you. And Nick, we were all over that on this podcast. It was just probably about a year ago. It was the day of the, before the draft in our preview. I was all over Pritchard because uh, like you, I'm a guy who devours college basketball. Yeah. And he reminded me to a lesser extent of a guy like Mitchell this year, who it's like everyone is just passing him over because he's a little older, a little smaller, but I've watched him play at the highest level and this kid can ball. And I was saying he will be a sleeper. I had him probably as one, a second round target. We got him at the end of the first, but either way, he's a winner. He's a winner. I, He's, I remember my hot take from draft night was that he would take Jeff Teague's role <laughs> very shortly. Into the season. And it happened not. right away. It was no. it, yeah, it, yeah. at the time it was a hot take. It uh, obviously didn't yeah. pan out to be. There's a lot uh, to love about Pritchard, obviously. And I want him, you know, I want him getting minutes, but ideally I think I would like him competing for minutes as opposed to him just sliding into the, to the backup role to begin of the year. And I know we talked about last time, someone like Patty Mills, you know, I'd love to bring him in to be, you know, the de facto number two, maybe start some game spot games here and there, but I want Pritchard competing with someone else. I don't want him just to be given handed that role ideally, but I, if, I think if that's what it comes down to, then, you know, there, you could I, be in a worse position. I, I think Pritchard has the DNA that he competes with himself to try to push himself and make himself better. He doesn't need to be, he doesn't yeah. need competition. He, he competes with himself. Pritchard's that guy. He, he lays it all on the court. I, I agree with you on that. I don't think it's so much competing for the role. I think it's more just having versatility in the kind of guards you can throw on the floor. And I think that's what's great about Pritchard and Smart is that I think they both can play with another point guard. So yeah. I think you can br- and you can bring in a guy like Patty Mills. He can play off the ball. So I think it's just having that optionality. So if we can find, again, that's why I'm saying – I don't need to splurge on another all-star point guard, but if we can find one of these guys like a Sadoransky, Patty Mills, I mentioned Ish Smith as a 12. TJ McConnell. Some, yeah. T, a TJ McConnell, someone like that. These are guys you could slot in without taking away minutes from Pritchard. It would be more just, you know, the best teams are usually the ones that are the most versatile. Give us ways to go small. Give us ways yep. to go big. Last year we were tied into that absolute garbage playing the two centers every night and it was just it became hard to watch i want a team that's versatile and can play more different ways like if we play one night against the team you know if we're playing the lakers and they're starting andre drummond and anthony davis we can start robert williams and horford if we're playing another team that has you know if we're playing the nets and they're basically playing durant at center then we can play three point guards like i want to be able to cover all our bases here so that's where i'm saying go out get like cheap options who can actually play. We've absolutely botched those signings in recent years, like Jeff Teague and Ennis Cantor, but uh, we got to hit, we got to hit on the margins. We got to hit with our vet minimums with, uh, 
what, it, what will most likely be the taxpayer mid-level this year. We, we got to bring in the right vets if we want to kind of take that next step and compete because we just have not had a, a deep enough roster and we've, we haven't been good enough on the margins, frankly. I have, I have one question for you since you're a college basketball junkie. What do you think about Scotty Barnes being that, you know, huge, big size point guard, you know, probably going to yeah. be a late lottery pick, you know. Ba- well, Barnes is not going to be a late lottery pick. He's going to well, go no, eight or he's nine. Gonna go fifth. Like he's, he's going fifth to the oh, Magic. Fifth, okay. But yeah. um, I – Barnes is a tough one for me, and I think it's funny that he's going to the Magic because they are just the team that collects athletes – from who, Florida State. Well, a gen- <laughs> yes, largely from Florida State, who it seems like the one skill they're missing is shooting. Yeah. And the Magic just collect those guys. So uh, Barnes, Do they I love. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, Barnes, to me, like you said, I love the athleticism. I love his competitiveness. He seems like he, he cares a shitload, which matters. Um, so I think he can go. He's a guy you want to build a culture around. He can be a leader. But it's just scary drafting those yeah. guys who can't shoot. The, la- the last guy, the last guy, around. the last guy fell in love with from Florida State with Jonathan Isaac, and uh, you know that year, pretty good before the injury. And a, and a lot of and a, you know he was he was progressing down the yeah. right path where he you know mm-hmm. that was the Tatum draft, and I was like for the current team right now because we didn't know Tatum was gonna no of course become Jason Tatum as he is today. I right. was looking at pieces that the Celtics needed at that time, and they needed that four tall guy could shoot, defend, yeah. run the and court. They, and they still do. And they still do. <laughs> and it, Jonathan Isaac, to me, was the guy that they needed, unfortunately, or yeah. unfortunately, right? They made the right move. They drafted Tatum, didn't draft yeah. Isaac. And unfortunately for Isaac, he's turned into someone that is now tough to get on the court. So if maybe... Yeah maybe just maybe you can swing a deal and try to bring Jonathan Isaac in here. Right. Yeah. Well, Orlando's got two picks. They got fifth and eighth tonight. So they, they could be in line for some consolidation because they're going to, at at a certain point, have too many kids to play them all and to pay them all. So yeah, if, uh, if they're down on Isaac, which I think, I don't think they are. Right. um, But maybe if he has a rough start, sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I would love that's like you said, I think that's, the kind of guy that they're missing in their starting lineup. It seems like they've got the wings, they've got guard, they've got bigs. They don't have that kind of stretch four who can kind of play on the perimeter and down low. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, he would, he would certainly fill that role on paper. Um, so again, tonight is the draft. Well, as we mentioned, we got the 45th pick. Any, anything specific that either you guys want to see the Celtics do with that pick, whether you just want them to trade it, whether there's a, some college player you fell in love with, or whether it's just like a certain role, like draft our backup point guard, any, anything specific. I got a few names I can throw at you guys, but I mean, obviously by 45th, it's pretty much a crapshoot. Yeah. I mean, it's probably going to be a, you know, stash and like stash and dash with the old yeah. time, right? They're going to take <laughs> right. some, some 17 year draft old and stash. Slovenia or Slovakia, right. Latvia or something, right? And that's very it. possible because that's- to me, you you take another guy, right? And I can mm-hmm. see tomorrow, oh my God, the Celtics got a four year guy and this and that, and now he's mm-hmm. taking away some minutes from this guy and that guy, and great, the main red claws can win a championship. <laughs> that's what it ends up coming down to. So to me, I honestly that's don't. The care. main Celtics now. Yeah, that that's correct. <laughs> right. Um, in Portland, I love. By the way, I'm not sure if you've ever been. Yeah. To Oh, I, great city. I used to have to go up there and play baseball all the time in old Hadlock Field, which is now where the Sea Dogs play. Yeah. And I got to love Portland. It's like a cleaner version of Boston. That's kind of like with Portland. It's smaller, cleaner. Yeah. Um, I, love, I, love, I, love I love Portland. Amen. I'd rather, I mean, obviously I don't really care. Like you said, like it's 45, but kick the can down the road, in my opinion, just trade it for, you know, a future second. I know seconds aren't really that valuable, but. Sometimes yeah. when you're facilitating, you know, marginal trades, seconds come in handy. I mean, obviously that's what got us. That's what got us uh, Fournier. So I don't know. Kick it down the road sure. and see if you see it has some value. You know, or maybe it'll be either. traded tonight. Maybe it'll yeah. be a throw in tonight. Who knows? Yeah. You know? Well, like I said, if you can get a guy, go get a guy who's at least has been in the league, like a Jarrett Culver, someone like that. I'd be all for it. If we're going to use the pick, 
I like watching summer league. So, you know, give me someone I can get excited about. So I'll give you guys some names. If you don't even know who these guys are, that's totally fine. If you have thoughts, feel free to weigh in. I sorted them by wings. So first of all, if we're going to take a shot of 45 on someone, give me a guy who's a wing who can fill that, you know, quote unquote, three and D role. Cause I think those are the most translatable skills. If a guy can shoot threes and play D in college, he'll probably be able to do that at the NBA. So like, let's find that next Jay Crowder, a glue guy, a bench guy, a role guy. So I got Kessler Edwards from Pepperdine, BJ Boston from Kentucky, Josh Christopher from Arizona state, Isaiah livers from Michigan, Aaron Wiggins from Maryland. Those are all guys who I think could be around. They're kind of bigger wings. They could shoot, play some D. Uh, Christopher is more of a pure scorer. Um, he'd more just be be kind of fun to watch. Any any thoughts at all on any of those guys? Any of those names mean anything to you guys? I mean, if I had to take if I had to take <laughs> one person, it would probably be from Arizona State, only because those are the hit or miss guys that become yeah. like really good or really True. bad. So in the second round, you're looking for yeah. a hit or miss. Right. Well, I think you could say with that, that could be the approach taking BJ Boston from Kentucky. Just say, hey, he's a Kentucky guy. We'll figure it out once he gets into the league. <laughs> you could hope. Um, right? I love, I really like Isaiah Livers from Michigan too. I, I'm surprised that he could be available. So those guys are, are intriguing to me. Um, two guards I had circled Quentin Grimes from Houston, who was obviously a knockdown shooter and led them on a deep run into uh, what the Elite Eight Houston made, I think before they finally lost or did they even make the final four? I don't know. Either way. Houston? Quentin Grimes. Yeah. yeah. No, Houston. I think Houston got there, right? Houston was, I, in I forget if they made the, I know they at least made the elite eight. I can't remember if they made the final four, either way, they made a deep run. Quentin Grimes was uh, at the center of that. He's a guy who I think his game would immediately translate. He could slot in and probably give you minutes right away. Another one, uh, Jason Preston kid had an amazing story. If you follow basketball, March madness, you probably heard the name plan for Ohio as they upset Virginia in the first round. Um, he is just a fun kid to root for. So I'd love to see him come in kind of a, uh, is, it, is it really an upset when you beat Virginia in the first round <laughs> that team exits in the first round? And you know what? Last year, even by the Vegas line, it might not have been an upset right. by tip off, but uh, either yeah. way, yeah, you got, you know, the 13 over the four or what have you. Um, so I, I would love to see Preston a six, five guard who, who can play without the ball can do more than a conventional point guard. If he's around, he's a guy I'd love to take a shot on. And then a couple big guys I threw in, uh, who might be available. Dayron Sharp from UNC. Kid is an absolute house. JT Thor from Auburn. You got Jericho Sims out of Texas, who uh, showed up to that clutch workout the other day and almost jumped out of the gym. And then Charles Bassey from Western Kentucky. Any thoughts on any of those guys? Unfortunately, you're the man tonight or today. <laughs> hey, that's, and you, right. and, and, and uh, Nick, I just figured it out since this show, this is being right now on the day, the morning of the draft, he threw out about 15 guys. <laughs> They're yeah. all going to be drafted pretty much in the second round. So he can come on and says, yep, I mentioned him. I did this. I did that. So exactly. good you, job. Get it. you covered, you see, you covered that's, everybody that's that's draft in the second round. That's what I do. I just, if you know what, if we had, a, if we still had 16th pick, I would have given you about 150 names. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. That's crazy. Oh, good stuff. Well, either way, um, just as a basketball fan and an NBA fan, I am very excited for the draft. I'm hoping that we get some fireworks tonight, whether Celtics related or otherwise. I'm just excited, uh, you know, to see some shakeups, to see some things that could happen. But uh, otherwise, uh, after that, you know, it's going to be fast and furious because then free agency is right around the corner. Summer League's right around the corner. Before you know it, uh, they'll be back in training camp. Crazy offseason. Um and again, as I mentioned, a lot of other good stuff going on in Boston sports as well. It's a fun time of year trying to enjoy the rest of summer, but uh, football is almost in the air too, you know? Oh, <laughs> so. It's in the air. If you woke up Sunday, <laughs> if you woke up Sunday morning, it felt like it was fall. It was a fall uh, football day. Well, like I said, I'm, I'm in Louisville, Kentucky, and I'm coming oh, from Nashville. Right. So I, yeah. I've been down South. So I can assure you, it does not feel anything like football yeah. down here, but uh I'm itching to get back to the Northeast for, for some of that fall weather soon enough. So um, any, anything else that either you guys want to touch on? I think we've hit most of the pressing issues with the Celtics, anything I've missed or any, any final thoughts? Is this the longest your one of your podcasts have gone? Cause we're at an hour and 45 minutes. So Oof. Uh, it's about average. 
No, oh, we, we could go pretty long sometimes, oh, especially no. if we haven't gotten We've broken together the two-hour hour. mark before. Yeah. Every time. Oh, we'll, yeah. be, right. we'll split it into two say, if we have to. All right. Yeah, be- before every pod, we say, yeah, this should be about 45 minutes an hour, and then all of a sudden we're at <laughs> two and a half <laughs> hours. The, the, the funny thing is, is you know, that going back to the whole Tatum trade and that tweet I sent out, I have – it's like one of the only shirts I have above my head is – Sure. Like I am not a, ta- I hate him tater, uh, a Tatum tater. <laughs> um, and so to me, they're like, take down the shirt. You don't deserve to have that shirt in the background. I'm like, I, and then someone actually called me racist. Like, oh. being, being, mm. cause, cause I always talk about DNA. Like I talked about D- DNA and, and, and some guy on Twitter's going, you are, you're a racist. We know who you are. We're going to find out where you live, this and that, what? because, because he brought the, he, he thought the DNA I was talking about was the color of his skin. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, no DNA, when it comes to basketball and everybody talks about sports, it's just the it factor. DNA mm-hmm. is the it factor. Right. People Not his born... literal genetic makeup. Exactly. <laughs> so like, I'm like, I'm like, seriously, seriously, yeah. I'm going to get hit well, with a And by the way, listen, I think you go on a Twitter rant. That's, yeah. that's the kind of stuff you're going to, I know. And, and by the way, I think, it, I think in the trade that was coming back was um, an African-American, um, a guy from Japan and right. um, where's Bert trans from Germany. Uh, where's he from? Yeah. I think for is is uh, Germany. Right. So it wasn't like I was trying to bring in a bunch of Peyton Pritchard's right. Like, like, <laughs> right. I don't get it. Yep. I don't know. Uh, oh, uh, sorry. Bertans is Lat- Latvian. Yeah, so, Latvia. I yeah, said that yeah. earlier. Right. I didn't mention Latvia. It was in my <laughs> you head. Did. Eastern European. Yeah. It's all yeah. You said you wanted. To, you said you wanted to draft and stash a Latvian. So I yeah, see where it's all coming full circle. <laughs> you is, want the is. next Bertans tonight. Yeah. That's the goal. So that's yeah. the goal for the Celtics tonight. Draft the next Davis Bertans. Yeah. Who's the highest rated <laughs> Latvian tonight? Right. Oh, I should know this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have that one in front of me. Um, let's see. If we can get, no, no, I'm not seeing any Latvians. <laughs> oh, Verens. I'm not even going to try to pronounce the name. No, 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 nope, no. Forget it. <laughs> no, no, give it, give it a shot. He projected. Who is it? He, I got him at 66 overall. Yeah. Verens Bleichenberg. Okay. We'll what's his position? What's, what's his, he's listed as a wing. He's 6'9". So that's about to... Bertans' size. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Hey, I want the Celtics to draft him. That's who I want to take with that's the, the guy. Yeah. That's All right, the guy. I love it. I'm in. <laughs> Let's make it happen. We're speaking it into existence right now. I, I have it on the record. I have the podcast receipt, and uh, I'll get that out later. <laughs> I love it. I'm all in. All right. Well, this was a lot of fun. Yeah. Dakota, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate the time. Glad to uh, let you come on here and explain yourself. So hopefully this will uh, cool some of the some of the people in your mentions coming after you now that they've had a chance to actually listen to the rationale and the frustration, and you've had a chance to get some of that on your chest. Um, anything you want to plug while you're here? No, I mean I'm good. I mean people that follow me on Twitter, you know. I mean I I, I have a, a couple of different companies that are sports related. One Swing Juice, SwingJuice.com. It's golf apparel. We're also um, signed a deal with the Major League Baseball Players Association, where now we're creating these cool T-shirts for the individual players, like Otani and Acuna, and and uh, the the Xander ones right here. You guys want to see it? And since this is Boston related, this is like a cool nice. yeah. Xander nice. Bogarts one, a Ruba flag in the background. You know, so um, that and uh, if you guys like, I can hang this up. If you guys like fantasy sports, I have a fantasy sports app that combines virtual slots with daily fantasy. So if you guys like to play slot machine apparatus type of game with daily fantasy, maybe you don't know who the players are, or you don't have time to figure out to create your lineup, you can go on fantasy spin, download it, create your lineup randomly, either playing quick picks or you could even lock in certain players. So there's games where you have 10 spins to create your best lineup, but you can't pick who you want. It's everything's delivered to you randomly first, and then you can lock in those players. So, and you can win instantly before the game goes off by spinning the highest rated players or afterwards. Unfortunately, it's not legal cash game right now. It's a free to play and win, but you can win tokens that you can redeem in a store for e-gift cards, fanatics cards, whatever we offer, you know, in the, in the reward store. So that's, fa- that's fantasy kind of spin. Plug. Yeah. Fantasy spin. Okay. Awesome. It's in Take both app stores. Yeah. In both app stores. 
Okay. Um, that and that's about it. But I'm taking that technology and building a dating site called eDate, where you're spinning your matches. So we take we're taking uh -huh. the the slot machine apparatus and kind of like making it into an online dating site. So you can spin your potential matches at random wow. and then lock in the ones that you like and win instant win messaging, win instant win photos and all that stuff. So we're I'm gamifying the online dating space. I love that. I love that. Who doesn't like to gamble with their dating life? Exactly. <laughs> right. exactly. It's, it's all a gamble anyways. Yeah, this is true. All right. That's great stuff. Guys, well, thank you very much. Uh, it was, this was a plot. I'm, I'm, I'm listen with all the comments and everything. God, I'm glad I saw yours when you, you would, cause there was a lot of people that were at me and calling mm -hmm. me a lot of names and this and that, and, but whatever, <laughs> no. um, you know, I saw yours and I'm like, you know, and then we started connecting. You asked me to come on and I'm like, yeah, I'm all for it. I mean, if I'm going to hey. throw myself out there, right. I, you know, I should Why be not? able to go ahead and, and back it up and, and talk with other people. No, I love but, it. And we're, we're always open to, you know, good banter and good conversation. And no matter how outlandish the take may seem, if, if you want to come on here and defend it, we, we love to chat hey, about it. So when Rui's and all, when Rui's an all star, okay. It's not going to be that bad of a take. And then Tatum ends up leaving. Okay. They're going to go, wow. Imagine if we had Rui right now. <laughs> uh, oh, I love it. All right. That's Dakota and Braintree. Follow him at Dakota Happis. Thank you all for joining us again on Chuddy's Corner. Enjoy the draft tonight, folks. And we will be back soon, as always, to discuss more Celtics. Enjoy the offseason. We'll see everybody soon. Go Cs. Strip the bolts on them. Should have never sent them to pick up the work for them. Spray the park and had my shit inside the car. Marcus Smart Boy was shooting with a 36 on him. Said if he wasn't in a rush, they was all goners. Tech cursive on the jets. He was going Sean John. They were sleeping on the garden at dawn.